Welcome. It's the 30, or this is April 1st, 2022, India Standard Time. And this is the Get Cash Maintenance Project Ideas brainstorming session. Uh, we're recording. Thanks everybody for joining. So the idea was in our last session, we started a bunch of discussions about various topics around how should the user interface interact and what would that mean? Um, I'm open to questions and discussions here. We've got a bunch of good questions on the, on the comments to this brainstorming document. Uh, if any of you have specific questions you'd like to ask outside the document or that are, are covered in the document that are, are on your mind, now is a great time to ask them. Uh, and let's talk through them. We will limit ourselves strictly to 60 minutes because I'm getting tired and it's been a very long day. <laughs> All right, so any, any specific questions, maybe I can, I can certainly give you a, an, an overview of the UI. Oh, Aryan, you had a question, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so basically uh, on, my, on my proposal, there was a comment by Cal, and I, I might be saying his name wrong, but uh, I, I just wanted to link it, I'll link it in the chat here. Okay. And uh, he was talking about, like in the previous session, we had talked about the, Get prefetch feature, and uh, he also like had some uh, insight on how we could use it and where, in which cases it would be useful and where it, it might not be, it not, it might not be like suitable in, in like some some cases. So I just wanted to like put this out there that like yeah he had he had like given me the, the, the uh, these suggestions. <laughs> okay, so this is where he and I are going to disagree. And I'm going to try to try to justify why I disagree. Uh, that's good. Very very good question. Okay, so uh, Kale Olavi Nimetalo is a a well known and very skilled user uh, of Jenkins. So, however, I think he's not understanding the context. So what he's saying in this first comment is, "Hey, I don't think it would be useful because you're already being notified every time there's a change." to the repository, but then he says here, oh, it could be useful for a repository used via git clone minus minus reference, which is precisely how the caches on the Jenkins controller are done. So, so they are not reference, but they are bare. And, and as bare repositories, they can then be used for other, other purposes. So, and, and now let's, so let's, let's talk through this a little bit. So a, a cache on the controller is being used to answer questions about the, the content of that cached repository. And if, if we prefetch content into that, then that does, that lets us not have to require that everything must use webhooks, first point because not everyone can use webhooks. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of people whose systems are behind a firewall and they're unwilling to configure webhooks. So they don't get notified and prefetch would let them bring down that data as it's detected every hour or two. So, so now then to his second point here, the Yes, it, it could save network bandwidth during it actually doesn't, it doesn't alter network bandwidth usage because the prefetch is fetching objects that will be fetched eventually. However, what, it, what the prefetch does is saves time during the fetch that will act on those changes because the objects are already there. Now his point here about it's not safe to remove objects from a reference repository is, is a valid and interesting case. If, the, if someone is using a reference repository, that's, that's a different, different circumstance. And, and he's right, that is not out of scope of this, uh, that is out of scope of this project. We're not worrying about these things being used as references, they're being used as caches. So Aryan, did that answer your question or am I not yet persuading you why I think that prefetch is useful for a Jenkins cache? 
Yes, yes, I understand. Okay. So, uh, would I, would I have to like uh, implement some safeguard for for that scenario when when there's like so where I'll have to disable the garbage collection over there? No, because because these caches are typically not well. They are typically not used as a reference repository. So the the caches are are hidden to Jenkins users, meaning the the Jenkins they are on the controller, and so a reference repository on a Jenkins controller should not be of any benefit because people shouldn't run jobs on Jenkins controllers. So the, the first, first goal is don't run jobs on the controller. Since you can't run jobs on the controller, or you, since you're recommended not to run jobs on the controller, you should not even be able to use the caches on the controller as reference repositories. A reference repository has to be on the same file system or on the same computer as the, the, the repositories that are referencing it. So now, now there are things though that we have to do in the prefetch to safeguard it. So while the while the disable garbage collection, we don't have to disable garbage collection on a repository that's being prefetched. Prefetch itself does things to avoid updating the the refs without the user know having requested that they actually be updated. So, but I think you may be aware of that from our last our discussion the last time. Prefetch does a has a very specific description in the Git maintenance page. Let's find that. There it is. Prefetch. And you are welcome to tell me, Mark. I already know this. You don't need to show it to me. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh well, I think it would still be helpful for others, but I think it only shows the delta of uh, of the in, of the new newly collected information. That is well. So, so the the crucial thing here for me, at least, is what happens when it does a prefetch. Is it modifies the ref spec to bring everything that's being pulled into a location that other commands won't find it. And, and that's that's this that's why they say here this is done to avoid disrupting remote tracking branches. So what happens when a prefetch runs is to the user it's as though nothing changed in that repository. So if if the master branch, for instance, on the remote received new objects, when I do a prefetch, my local copy I can't see those objects in the usual way if I look at a, a git log of the master branch. Prefetch effectively hides them, but pulls them anyway. It hides them in this ref slash prefetch thing. And that, that way it's not bringing in an update to the master branch that I did not exp explicitly request. Did, is, is that part, well, have I explained that or would you like to ask questions about it? Oh no, I I understand. So yeah, I, I remember it from the previous meeting. I thought. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so so the idea is objects that would have been pulled by the user asking, "Give me the latest changes on the remote tracking branch," are already there locally, but they're just sitting in this ref's prefetch location, and when I ask for them, they get also recorded in the ref slash origin. Okay, and, and uh, the prefetch would uh, uh, also be making the fetch command faster, right? Right, exactly. That's, that's what, that's in fact the, the benefit is that by having done prefetch, objects that would have had to have been fetched during the get fetch command requested by the user are already there. Okay. All right. Anything else with regard to prefetch? Let's see. So did we address back to the question from Kale? or the observations from Kale? Did you did did that address your question, Aryan? Yes. 
Okay. Good, all right. Now, there had been some discussion here uh, relative to UI that I wanted to double check that everybody was okay with, with the concepts. Are you, are you in your draft thinking about how the user will interact with, with, the, with the, the maintenance system, with the maintenance configuration? Uh, I was I was thinking that uh, we can uh, we can have the options that you have, and uh, I was I was thinking of adding options such as uh, comparing it with with previous runs, or saving a particular run so that it can be compared with later on. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So so that's a so the you said the idea was compare compare with a previous run yeah. and what sorts of things would you envision that the the user might do with that how might that comparison be presented maybe uh if the user wants to uh manually edit some of the tasks and how they are run and uh they might want to change some of the config values so what this would allow them to do would be to uh, they can they can have a specialized way so that uh, for, for their specific repo, uh, repository that they are using uh, and how it can and how get uh, GC can get GC and the maintenance commands can help them uh, optimize their time. Ah, okay. So so okay. And now I think I'm seeing. So for example, a a very large Git repository may need different options for Git GC. Yes. Interesting, okay. Good. So Mark, uh, as we were discussing earlier, uh, what I had in my mind in terms of UI uh, was that the administrator uh, to, uh, in an organization where people are using Jenkins, uh, not everyone would have the option to um, change the strategy for these tasks. So as a developer, if I'm going to run my build, I don't know or I don't care how the optimizations are working uh, within the Jenkins system, right? It could be possible. This, from an administrator's perspective, I understand that uh, you know we're providing a page where we're going to give, um, uh, maybe we can give on some heuristics on basis of which they could uh, create a strategy and run these tasks, these individual maintenance tasks. Uh, so if that is the case, if we're providing this page for the uh, user, uh, for the administrator, then as far as I'm aware, and please correct me if I'm wrong, how would we um, show the run history there? I mean, if we're thinking that based on our previous performances, we want the user to choose how uh, they, they want to update their strategy of running these tasks, how would we do that? As far as I understand, they, they, those are two separate areas of the Jenkins UI. Uh, like in my global setting page, I can't see uh, in the configuration, I can't see my previous builds, right? That is a history that is available to me in that context. Yeah, so good question, Rishab. So so this was a, this is a, a, a concept that for me, I wasn't, I wasn't entirely settled on first because Okay, I'm going to bring up an example just to, to talk through what I think you're, you're noting is that the maintenance tasks, for me at least, I don't think of as, as, um, as jobs in the sense that they're Jenkins jobs. I think of them more as the results of the, of the maintenance job may come out in some sort of a log like this Git polling log because, because I was assuming mm -hmm. the maintenance tasks aren't the same as a Jenkins as a Jenkins job 
Is, is that consistent with what you were thinking as well? Yes, I mean, there would be there would be an abstract concept or maybe hidden for a regular user. Not right. something that everyone has to worry about, right? Because they won't be, not everyone is going to be aware how Git GC is going to work, even if it's a developer who's using to build a repository. Yeah, so, so, and so my assumption there had been that somehow we would need in this accessible from this maintenance UI access to a history of these logs. Today, the Git polling log is an example only shows one. It shows the most recent. And if I click poll now, it will, and then show the Git polling log, we'll see it updates the polling log, but I don't have any history of it. So that, that the Git polling log is actually not the kind, not quite the concept I had for tasks. I was thinking these maintenance tasks had some history and, and some configuration that defines them, but I'm not sure that they can be validly called a freestyle job because I don't think they are. So it seemed like, do they need to be some kind of different new job type or a, a new lightweight task type? Was that, was that sort of a question you were asking or am I off base there? I mean, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to understand that uh, when we're talking that we, uh, when we're talking about how we want the user to use the job history to determine the strategy to update or modify the strategy that they have for these maintenance tasks. And if uh, those, the schedule and the strategy for the, for those tasks are configurable at the administrator page level, how does that, I mean, uh, what I'm not able to picture is how do we connect those two things? Yeah, okay, so so let me, let me see if I can catch. So since tasks are a new, a new concept, how do we, how do we connect or how does the user how does the administrator see the results of those tasks and configure them? Is that sort of? Hmm. Is that the kind of question you're asking or am I not getting it yet? Yes, yes, yes. And, and so my thought had been, okay, if we've got if we've got a task definition in the UI in this scribbled section here, would we have a, a selection over on one of the columns on the right that says something like, show me the history of this task. And then a page would appear that is the history of the task. And that, that page may look something like this, this build history page. Let's see, can I see the... Where's the history? Well, may, may, may conceptual back, here we go. It could be something like the history of, of the builds. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then from there, okay, I can pick one and look at its, its log, its console output to, to see what, so that was my, my idea, but I'm open to other ideas. Is this something that we should probably, I don't know, we should maybe in the proposal see that how people want to do it, right? How they want to present um, this challenge. I, I would think so, because I think that, I think the how does the administrator interact is, is an important part of this, of the project. Yes, and I, and uh, like a, small part of that question is that is this feature uh, mainly focusing the administrators or is it is it available for everyone who is going to access the Jenkins instance and, and do we want to hide out that information for some people I was assuming we wanted to hide it that we would that this is purely for administrators if you don't have administrator permission 
you you can't do anything with these the, the this page would just not be available so now i'm open to being being wrong about that because because my thought was this is purely an administrator function because one of the actions might conceptually be delete the schedule, right? Just yes. stop the thing from doing any maintenance and your users might suffer if some malicious user said, I'm going to stop the maintenance of all of our Git caches. Or well, should they increase the frequency for a prefetch or garbage collection? Yeah, there you go. Hey, we've got the Linux kernel repository here and we're gonna garbage collect it every three minutes. Yeah. And the answer is no, that, that won't work. So yeah, good point. Yep. I want we I wanted to discuss about the, you know the order of execution of the git maintenance. Okay. So we stopped we stopped right there, you know, after prefetch and incremental repack. Last time when we were trying the loose objects, I don't know if you uh, remember, but you know, the loose objects didn't get deleted. Okay. Uh, I've, I've gone through it and uh, Mark, can you open a big repository like in your terminal? Sure, you bet. So you want to see a big repository like maybe, let's see if I've got a copy of the Linux, of the, the Linux kernel. Would that, is that, that's probably big enough, yeah. I assume. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me get a new terminal window, just a minute. Locate Linux-stable. Let's see if I've got one readily available. Oh, I don't see it here. How about, let's go to a different computer. Oh yes, there we go. Okay, so here is an older copy of a Linux Linux kernel. Whoops. Uh, can can you have a look at the uh, you know loose objects present in the Git directory? Oh sure, you bet. All right, so okay, not many yeah. loose objects in this one, but go ahead. No, no worries. Uh, can you run the git maintenance, you know, or run the loose object command? Ah, okay. So, so let's, let's do it with one that's not quite as big as this one then. I think, I think if you're okay with it, let me go to a different, a slightly different repository. So let's go here. Okay, this one has more yeah. loose objects. Yeah. All right, and the if I remember right, this the directory is relatively large, so 180 meg if I read that correctly. All right. So can and you so, run the loop object uh, maintenance command? Okay, so git maintenance run minus minus tasks equals and is it loose objects? Loose. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. Okay, so maybe it's a uh, task, not tasks. Okay. Yeah. Now, can you have a look at the you know the pack uh, pack files? No, this sure. doesn't get deleted uh, right now. You have to run it once again. Okay. So let's look at the pack. And you want to see the the date stamps on the pack files? So there is a, uh, yeah. two files, loose IDX and loose pack. Now, can you run the lose objects command once again? Sure. And okay. now, can you have a look at the lose objects? I don't think you'll find any. Ah, okay. So, right. Okay. So, that's how this was. Last time when we were trying, you know, it wasn't a, a displaying. So, basically, what I was thinking, the order of, uh, you know, the maintenance commands, should be prefetch loose object and incremental repack because I'm not sure if incremental repack takes considers the loose object, you know, pack ref file. So it's better if we go in this way is what I was feeling. Okay, so so talk me through that again. So it was what you were thinking was it the order should be you said prefetch, then 
loose objects. Uh, initially, it was an uh, incremental repack, but now I suggest if we have loose objects first. Okay, so task loose objects. And the reason for that is what loose objects does is it, it collects them. It, it collects all of them and puts them in a pack file. Okay, so to copy loose objects, into a pack, all right. And then the uh, uh, the thing about incremental repack, I haven't found anywhere on the internet whether you know it considers loose objects or not behind the scenes. Okay, so it, it doesn't matter if you know incremental repack is placed in front of loose objects, but it's safer if we put loose objects in front of you know incremental repack so that we don't miss out on it. Okay. So, and the idea then is if we do an incremental repack, so if I do an incremental repack here, and now what it's, it's done is it has, uh, I've still got my loose objects, okay. So obviously I'm gonna to have to read what incremental repack does. So incremental repack, repacks using multi-index feature. Okay, multi-pack index, right, all right. Ah, okay, so this was looking at combining multiple smaller packs into a large single larger pack for efficiency. Got it, okay. So the also idea- it would be, Also, it would be easier to search for any, you know, get objects uh, using multiple, you know, uh, this incremental repack because all the objects are sorted, okay. So it would be easier uh, as we would be using binary search, okay. So that would re reduce the time complexity as well. Okay. So it would be your recommendation was loose objects, then incremental repack, and then prefetch? No, no, prefetch no. In, uh, at first, okay. Then ah. loose objects, then incremental repack. Right, okay. So pack task prefix, prefetch to retrieve, retrieve new objects. New objects. And then loose objects to copy the loose objects to a pack, pack. and incremental repack to combine them to small smaller packs into larger packs. And then I would I was thinking about commit graph and then uh, you know GC garbage collection. And commit graph is is creating a database. It's creating a a, a record of the commits that are available in the in the object database, right? Yes. So, and so, yes, okay. Updates the commit graph file incrementally. And uh, last time I, we, we had a discussion about, you know, the commit graph where on every fetch, it keeps upgrade, updating the commit graph, which is a very huge task, right? I've, uh, I've gone th uh, through, a web, uh, you know, uh, through the web and I've read that, you know, uh, the commit graph uh, uh, updates incrementally it upgrades in various files okay it's not like it's going to upgrade all the commits at the same time so it's not a huge uh, uh, you know uh, process it won't take that much time to process good okay so it's not as expensive an operation as we thought it might be I, i've shared a link there on the right side mark can you see the dev block yeah yeah so one. is whoops did i miss it Ah, oh, yes, here it is in this one. Yeah, and I was reading this earlier today. Thank you very much. So this is showing how the commit graph may start as a single thing and grows into multiple files. Good. Okay. So if you run the, you know, commit graph command in that uh, same, uh, you know, repository, uh, you would find a commit graph file, okay. So let's do that.
And does it go into the? Yeah. Uh, so no, there's. No, uh, it, it, no, that not there. Uh, I'll be in uh, sure which way the directory. Objects in fours. I'm not sure. Is it in object slash? It's not in there. In fours. Is that in fours? Uh, okay. In oh info. Okay. In four and. And then in refs, no. One. Hey, do you have so a tree it, command? Oh. Sure. Uh, you mean like an LS tree? Yeah, yeah. A, a tree, a tree where you get everything in a tree view. Uh, yeah, I think that will do it, won't it? No. Nope. Here, let's do it this way. Okay, so now we can go exploring. Oh, and it should be an object. So maybe it's info. that I have, oh, uh, info and commit, commit graph. Yes, yes. Okay. Can, can you see that uh, there's a commit graph chain, okay, which links both the co commit graphs together, okay? So one commit graph uh, keeps building when you keep doing the fetch command, which doesn't disturb other commit graphs. So basically you won't be uh, modifying or updating all the commits, which won't be a huge task. Got it. So, um, well, and, and that matches. So what we see here is March 31, this file was created. And I assume in the commit graph chain, that is the second file in the list. It is. File. Yes. Uh, Mark, can you check in your global config, uh, git global config, if you have a fetch.write commit graph as true, enabled as true? Sure, yeah, let's check that. So git config minus minus list. No, let's do this. Okay, I don't see it there. Now let's check minus minus global. And it was, you were looking for write commit graph? Yes. Okay, I don't see one there. And let's check what, system. No, nope, I don't have git, one. What is the Git version that you're using right now? Uh, I think this is 2.35. Yeah, 2.35.1, mm. so current. So what Trishikesh is talking about, uh, sorry if I pronounce it wrong, um, is um, to, oh, uh, to write the commit graph incrementally after every fetch. That is a recent change as far as I read when I pointed out that fact last time that it, if we don't have a property enabled in the previous versions, it won't incrementally fetch it every time we are doing performing a gate fetch. The way right, the commit graph, as I read, would earlier work was that the GC was tasked to uh, update it and every if the distance between, if the time period between the GC and the fetch is long, then when you're performing the get fetch, it's going to take more time. It's going to be an intensive operation because GC was supposed to do it. They recently, the, the author who actually developed Comic Graph, from what I read from his blog, he said that they recently, with the recent versions, included this um, uh, configuration by default, which is called fetch.write commit graph. And if it's enabled true, it's going to incrementally update the commit graph on each fetch so that they don't have to bear the cost of doing it once in a while. Mm. Yeah, yes, you're, you're correct. You're absolutely correct, Rishabh. It's even stated on that docu on that website there, uh, which I've sh shared. Yeah, I guess we're reading uh, the same. Versions, yeah. yeah, version 2.24, greater than version 2.24, uh, write comment graph is enabled by default. So we have to consider cases where, you know, a get version less than 2.24, we have to enable it in the Jenkins Git plug. Correct. Ah, okay. So what you're saying is the default setting on older versions is suboptimal? Yes. Ah, okay. All right, so the, okay, so, and so, whoops, okay. I mean, it would depend on a lot of factors. If it's suboptimal, uh, 
it could be suboptimal. Uh, since the GCA starts to update it, uh, we don't know what kind of activity that repository is going through. If uh, you know the fetch is actually going to cost a lot uh, in terms of commit graph uh, when you're talking about, but yeah, it could be. It potentially could be. That is what the author says. Okay, all and right. That is so why they introduced that feature. Yeah. The blog uh, and the feature uh, hmm. notes that it may be expensive. That, yes. that fetch, and is it a safe way to say that the fetch may be more expensive? Hmm. May be more expensive than, than if commit graph had been updated. Is, is that the right way to say it, Rishab? Am I missing something? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, Mark, if you run the git gc command in that uh, uh, same repository, the loose objects get deleted. So, you know, it gets packed into... Okay, and so, and I think this one had already had that done. <laughs> Lose objects, the pack file I meant. Oh, oh, the pack. Oh, right. I see what you're saying. So okay. this, these files here, loose here and mm. loose here, those would get, be removed. Yeah. Now, okay. I, I don't promise you that Git GC will run terribly fast here. Okay. Oh, oh, wait a sec. I made a mistake. The, the maintenance manual says, please use this. Yeah. Git maintenance run minus minus task GC. Oh, okay. It's not bad. And now, if we look, everything's packed. Okay, so into it one. it it packed everything into a single, and that thing is now. How big is that? Now I've got to see. It's only 17 meg, so it's actually using the reference repository quite well because this repository, the repository that this thing represents is over 100 megabytes. That's good. Okay, great. And there are some loose objects again. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so now what do we, uh, do we again run the loose object, uh, you know? No, no, because, because no, right. it'll be handled okay. in the future, right? It just, just okay. when, when fetch happens, it, so the sequence we had described was, hey, if we do a, let's be sure where we had it, it was prefetch to retrieve new objects. So I did the fetch. Then we could conceptually say, okay, fine. We're going to run loose objects to form them into a pack and then incremental repack and commit graph to update them and less frequently a GC. And, and that's the one that tasks GC less frequently because it's so expensive. Good, okay. So Rishikesh, oh, go ahead Rishab. Oh, no, sorry. I'm sorry. Please continue. Mm -mm. I didn't mean no, to no. interrupt. I was just asking a question. Please go ahead. No, so uh, I just had a suggestion while looking at uh, these experiments that we've been doing. So uh, in the pro proposal, uh, would it be uh, beneficial for everyone, for the students who are writing the proposals to uh, start with a repository of their liking uh, and define the parameters of the repository, which are going to be affected by the maintenance uh, tasks, like the size, maybe the number of objects, uh, the, uh, the number of loose objects and the uh, pack files, and the number of references that that repository has, and then uh, define their strategy, whatever they think is the best strategy to run these tasks, run them and sort of show how that has affected the state of uh, the repository 
and while describing uh, how each of the individual tasks have affected uh, the parameters that we initially defined while we were um, trying to run this experiment and then describe it instead of uh, you know just describing how these commands are going to work because that is something that anyone can google and find out right but to uh, choose your own type of repository and then to run it and to show how it would actually work uh, would be a good experiment but I, it's something i just wanted to ask what uh, with the other mentors as well it's something that we uh, should be expect in a proposal good good question so so the idea then is if if the if the proposal said hey i have this sample these sample repositories so a, a few sample repositories and and let's say we're going to do jenkins dash bugs as the, as my example hmm. uh, and others and then the idea you were suggesting is run the run through a series of run a series of comparisons of the operations and their impact on the repository yes so the idea being okay if if a bunch of new commits arrive and in this particular repository example, I give there are a bunch of new commits that seem to arrive pretty regularly. Um, then I do the prefetch. And yes. what's the impact? What's the impact on the prefetch? So what happens from prefetch? And it's, mm -hmm. ah, we got this many new loose objects, we got this many, and then, all right, now we're gonna do loose objects. And yes. what happens then? And then likewise, a, an incremental repack and the same story. Now what's, what's the, the, the result of that? Is that sort of what you were describing? Yes, Mark, this would, this would be more, much more, I would say valuable for me individually when I look at a proposal, instead of definitions of what a git prefetch or loose object or incremental repack would be, because that is something that I can anyways go to the page and see, right? So this would be something that for me, I, I, I would say, and maybe beneficial for the people who are writing it to, uh, you know, come up with the right strategy that they think uh, would be because I think uh, even if it, we have to talk about the user interface, but before that we need to know what kind of a strategy we're going to choose, right, for the maintenance tasks. So I, it could be an aspect of it. I'm not saying that it right. has to be. Here. Yeah. Well, and and in terms of sample repositories, I, if I recall correctly, we've got in the Git client plugin one or two samples actually coded in the source code, right? Of Here's a yes. large, medium, and a small. So um, see the Git plugin source code, Git client plugin source code for the URLs of some example large repositories. Now they are not, I don't know that they are chosen as highly active repositories. Okay. They're, they're large, but relatively quiet, if I remember correctly. Whereas the Linux kernel is both large and very active. And this Jenkins bugs repository in my in my GitHub is is quite active. I I tend to clutter it with a lot of junk. So this is yeah this is where uh, yeah we would leave that to the student right how they're uh, choosing the repository based on what parameters is something that would be really interesting. The activity activity would determine the commit size and uh, how they're being updated, and then. Um, yeah, size would be more related to the objects and the management of objects. So yeah, that it would, that is what I was thinking. Right. I, I like that as a, that's a good suggestion, I think for consideration is, as candidates are putting in their proposals, consider that idea, hey, should, should we look at the strategies and the alternatives? I think that's worth, worth discussing, yeah. Okay. 
We've got about 15 minutes left. Are there topics, other topics that are on your mind? I had a, a not, I had another doubt regarding the execution of the Git maintenance. Like we are running it globally, right? So on many repositories. So are we gonna execute it serially or parallelly? You know, creating multiple threads and then running a way, you know, various repositories or like sequentially one after the other. I and I like that question very much. And that, uh, let's let me make some notes on that question because. For me, that's a part of global configuration and how the user experience it. And it may, it may have very different answers depending on some things. So how do we, how do we decide the scheduling of the maintenance tasks, right? So the crucial question is, can we schedule maintenance tasks in parallel? Uh, what if that overloads the controller? Because Git GC of the Linux kernel will by default take every thread, every core on that processor to perform its job, if I remember correctly. Git, Git GC is designed to be massively parallel. And so it would, if we, if we schedule too frequently, we may consume that controller's processor and it may not be able to do its real work because we're so busy doing, doing garbage collection. So you recommend, are uh, you not executing it serially? I, I'm, that's, that's what I'm, I'm not sure how to think about it yet in terms of, okay, so the question might be, um, how do we allow, so, how do we allow the administrator to choose? And how do we measure the impact, measure and report the impact of maintenance? Rishab, go ahead. Yes, so what I wanted to say was that it depends on what is our priority. I mean, with parallelization, what we are going to achieve, um, let's say the tasks, if they were above for all of the repositories, it would take X amount of time if they were serialized, uh, run in a serialized fashion. If we're doing it parallelly, it would be X minus some time. Is that our priority or the priority is to make sure that we do not, as you said, overload the controller and uh, you know, avoid the risk of actually sabotaging the real work that Jenkins, technically this is not what the user has come to Jenkins for. Good, good so, point. I, and I think you're right. The first priority is to, is to do no harm, right? To use the, the medical phrasing. So mm -hmm. don't harm the controller. Don't, don't, Arm the controller with these tasks. Now, there's going to be some cost. It's not free to run a garbage collection, but so I think then that would lobby prefer serial tasks until proven otherwise, right? Because that's the lowest lowest risk. Yes, and with serialization, I believe uh, if the administrator is looking at how the maintenance schedule is working on a repository, let's say I feel like, oh, you know, this is not working as I wanted it to be, so I can stop it. Uh, you know, the, the cost of stopping it maybe not uh, at that point would not be as huge as, uh, let's say, 10, already 10 repositories have, uh, you know, used that schedule, whatever I chose, that I thought would be perfect, but in practice, it's not. Ah, okay. So, so yours, when you said stop, I was envisioning that you were referring to a, a running maintenance task interrupted, but no, I think you were describing chain, redefine a schedule. Uh, yes. What I meant was, let's say I, um, as an administrator, I, in my mind, I had, uh, you know, a frequency and interval of who, how the tasks would work, uh, but I've never, uh, I, in practice, I, I didn't try those tasks, how they would, uh, you know, perform the maintenance. But 
in serialization, I would get to see that in the very first, the first repository that they're going to run. In parallel parallelization, I won't have that control. Right? It would just get going to run on let's say ten jobs. So it for me, it seems like it'll be safer if it runs at one job. I get to see it, and if I want to stop the whole process, yes, I I meant interrupting. If it's a serialized fashion, I, I get the option to interrupt it uh, between two repositories, but it's about to go to the next repository. Ah, okay. So serial execution, I think you're saying serial execution may be easier to interrupt, to safely interrupt. Good, okay. Did did that capture what you were what you were thinking, Rishab? Yes. Okay. I think yes. Also, another doubt regarding testing: Are we going to uh, you know use the test uh, you know test driven development approach? You know, write the test and then execute. Uh, about that, how uh, how are we going to proceed with that? Good question. So preferred development technique. So um, Mark has a strong bias. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rishab has firsthand experience with Mark's strong bias towards test-driven development. I like test-driven development. I like it because, because it, it helps me do a better job personally. Um, it, it's, it's write tests as you go use the tests to explore, um, learn from the tests, and don't be afraid to discard tests when they're, when they're no longer helping you. So Rushikesh, did that answer your question? Yes. So now, now one of the, this, this, the question also highlights a, a point of hypocrisy, if you will. Um, the Git plugin and the Git client plugin are difficult to test. And why are they difficult to test? Um, because they were initially created without tests. Okay. And, and I wish I could say it were different than that, but I did a I, I, I've done a 30 minute talk actually on the history of the Git plugin and the Git client plugin. For the first 18 months or two years of the life of the plugin, there was not a single automated test, not one. And and they were they were evaluating prototypes very, very rapidly, and they didn't get any value out of the test, so they didn't write tests. And, but that means the structure of the code is not always well suited to writing automated tests. And so, so that's, that's me acknowledging my hypocrisy, right? No, I was not the person who wrote the, the plugin in those first two years. Uh, I've, if you look at the history the blame of files in the Jenk, in the Git plugin, most of the blame on tests is my name. So I'm, I'm, I wrote a bunch of tests, but initially there were no tests for the first at least 18 months of the life of the plugin. So, so Rushikesh, what I hope that says to you is we try to be pragmatic and sometimes it's exceedingly difficult to write an automated test. And then we talk to each other about, okay, shall we, shall we spend the time and energy to write this test? Okay. So there may be places where we, we, we are not able to write a test. You know? Yes. Shame on me for say, for admitting the truth, but yes. Rishab, would you say that that's a, am I being honorable here? Am I saying things that are accurate? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that, um, and I agree with that was the, uh, one of the things which uh, I learned, uh, you know, was the first thing that I learned was um, test-driven development. 
that was something that I didn't consider. In my mind, when I used to give estimates, it was all about writing the feature and how much time that would take. And I never considered how much time it would for me to take. And it takes considerable time to think about the, um, the state space of how your uh, feature, whatever if it, it is, even if it's a line, single line code, how it's going to affect the users. And especially for a plugin, which is uh, distributed to a such um, you know, wide audience, uh, it, it's necessary to uh, think to have that uh, sort of uh, principles there for development. So right. I, I and I would say while writing, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that while writing the proposal, it should be considered that uh, you know when you give your estimations, just uh, as as I was a yeah, you know uh, an amateur developer, I never thought about, I didn't consider the amount of time it would take to test the features that I thought that I'm going to deliver. So uh, you need to factor that in as well when you think of estimations. Good, good point. And, and just, so, just so everyone's clear why, why I think that's so important, within the first 30 days of a release of the Git plugin, there are 90,000 installations using it around the world. And those 90,000 installations probably have 10x that many users. So we could, we could harm close to a million people if we do something badly wrong. So, so it's, it, 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 is, yeah. it is not uncommon for us to be very careful about how we, what we allow into a Git plugin release. It, it is pretty scary now. Yeah, uh, I have sorry. To think every, I have <laughs> to think every time before I code. Right. Well, and, and, and part of, part of open source project coding is sort of that thing, right? Is, you got a lot of people who depend on you, and and so be careful. Uh, that we we don't stop changing it, but we're careful, we, and we are very careful. All right, we've got two minutes left. Anything else in, in that last two minutes before we end? I had found a Jira issue where, uh, where this project idea was probably initiated uh, at the very first time. So I just wanted to like share that link, and if, if there was like some potential discussion from the users of of the uh, of, of the people that were having this issue. Uh, I, I noticed that there were some issues involving uh, that the, the the data was not being cleared. Uh, for for like the master and the slave repositories for both of them. So is that something that we can ensure that in our implementation we we do? So this project is actually not giving real consideration to the agents. So what is called a slave here, because the cache the cache management is only happening on the controller on the the thing they, that's called the master here. Um, this this won't help agent-based environments. It will only address um, only address things on the controller. Is was that your question, Aryan? Yes. Yeah. So so now now and this comment from Kali saying Git has an automatic GC. While that's correct, it's not been. I've not found the automatic GC to be sufficient to solve the problems we had, for instance, on ci.jenkins.io. Automatic GC is, is too lightweight. It, it, it's correctly realizing that if it performs an automatic GC during a fetch, it's going to slow down the fetch dramatically. And so they try with an automatic GC to keep it as light as they can. And our intention with maintenance is to invest the energy to make it better, to, to, to do more improvements and spend more time doing those improvements. Yeah, good good pointer to this to this uh, this one. Thanks. All right, thank you. We've we've hit our time. Thanks very very much for your patience. We will, if you are interested, we could meet again in two weeks. Uh, that will be after we've entered the period for, let's see, let's double check. I think that's after we've, we've entered the time when applications would be accepted. 
but it's not after the time when the applications are closed. So if you're interested, we could, we could plan to meet again in two weeks on the 15th. Are you interested? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we will, we will plan to, and it's on the calendar. So we'll plan to meet in two weeks. And yes, reviews between now and then as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Thank you.